So good afternoon to everybody and a very warm welcome indeed to Feud Free Family Festivities. Um, Jennifer Liston Smith here, Director of Coaching and Consultancy with My Family Care. I'm delighted to have with us today a, a really expert and uh, engaging panel to unpack this topic. We have to make an apology for mentioning Christmas as we are obliged to do so many times during this webinar today, <laughs> but I guess you've, you've all signed up with a view to really unpacking the topic which we plan to do together. And key in helping us do that, we're absolutely delighted to have Susie Heyman with us today, very well known as an agony aunt in Woman Magazine and various other um, publications that she's she's written for along the way, such as Woman's Own and The Guardian and The Times and so on, counsellor and trustee of Family Lives, the charity. So Susie, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here and hello everybody. And Susie's written several books that may be of interest and on the slide at the end with um, resources listed you can see various elements of, of what we might unpick today being, being captured there in those mm. book titles. So there will be useful resources potentially going forward. Yeah. We, we are also delighted to have with us Amanda Sasada from the My Family Care Executive Coach Team, experienced webinar presenter and, and also somebody who does a lot of, of group coaching, one-to-one -one coaching and, and seminars around areas such as work-life balance as well as bringing your own huge amount of personal expertise in this area, Amanda. Hi, Jennifer. Yes, I'm really pleased to be here. Yeah, I guess the huge experience is, um, is, is down to having four children, what can I say? <laughs> four teenagers now. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you, Amanda. And also delighted to have Harriet Dean, one of our childcare consultants and maternity mentors here at My Family Care. Again, Harriet brings a huge wealth of information of working with parents and families in our, our client organizations. Many of you may know Harriet, and indeed you have your own personal family experience to share as well, don't you, Harriet? Absolutely. Um, hello, everyone. I'm single mum to two children, um, huge advocate of Christmas, so looking forward to this webinar. <laughs> Great. Many thanks, Harriet. So most of you on the line will already know My Family Care. We provide your work and family space. In a nutshell, we're about enabling employers and employees to make work and family work. Um, so we have the guests with us today who are happy to, to share information and ideas, but we'll also be inviting you to engage as we go along as well. Um, so one of the things that's worth knowing is that we're recording the session, so you can listen again afterwards in case there are things that you may want to hear again. Um, we really valued all the information that you input on registration. There's a huge amount of sharing there, and we're going to touch on some of the themes that you raised um, in very concrete ways. Um, do type in questions as we go along if there are further things that you'd like to see covered and please do take part in the polls that we'll be launching at various points during this session to, to share information. So here are some of the points that we promised to address on registration. Some of the highs and lows of Christmas. What do we want? How do we manage expectations, those of our own and of others? And how do we survive and thrive and perhaps make it through to a new year with, with some perhaps added resilience through, through taking a slightly different approach to Christmas, potentially. Um, one of the things we're aware of as we go forward in this webinar is that we, the panel, will need to steer a course between the kind of more frivolous, light-hearted notes to, to what we could, could call Christmas stress and, and some of the more serious issues that can crop up and, and emotions that can be triggered at this time of year. So, Bear with us if you feel we're erring a bit too much on one side or the other, depending on, on your, your own position. Um, but we'll really attempt to embrace what you know it can be a season of, of some extremes for some people. So we'll, we'll attempt to be kind of all-inclusive. But as I said, do type in questions if you feel you'd like to draw us particularly in one direction or another. So we're going to launch our first poll to, to make sure that we get everybody sharing and engaged um, in the webinar. So what are the high points? We promised to look at the highs and lows of Christmas, and believe me, we'll be looking at some of the, the challenges shortly. But what are the good things about this season? What does it mean to you? And you can pick more than one of these um, at the moment. So if, if you wanted to say it's a break from work and you enjoy giving and sharing, you can pick both of those. Um, for some, it may be this time of year is a religious festival, naturally the, the Christian festival that we're aware of at the heart of Christmas, but for some, you know, it's just been Diwali, it's Hanukkah coming, so maybe you also celebrate the solstice. So it could be that this time of year 
is, is a time that you, you celebrate as a genuine festival, or perhaps it's a time of year when, when there are just kind of nice, nice lights and good times. So, so let us know what it is that, that um, makes Christmas a good thing. Um, but panel, I mean, do, do we enjoy Christmas? Do you enjoy Christmas? Love it. I absolutely love it. And I'll tell you, the funniest thing is, this is Susie speaking, I'm actually Jewish, which my family is, but I'm not religious at all. I love Christmas. My grandmother always used to celebrate it, even though she was actually quite a Zionist, um, because as she said, better parties and better presents. And, and, and I, I just love the winter. I love the sort of the winter festivities idea. It's an ancient festival about light and bringing that spring, bringing you know, hope for the future. And I love presents, not for the things, but for the giving, the packing them up and the, mm -hmm. the, the presenting them to people, giving people presents. I love that television ad last year with a little boy desperately waiting for Christmas, not for his presents, but to give his parents their presents. And that, to me, is what Christmas is all about. In fact, it's sharing the goodwill and sharing the love. Absolutely. Um, so we'll let the pun ro poll run for just a moment longer. Um, a couple of questions have come in already, which is great. Um, one comment that Christmas is too commercialized, all about money. I think many of us would agree that, you know, seeing um, tinsel in the shops in, in October or September even can be a little bit galling. Um, also an interesting question, perhaps related to, to Susie's comments there about combining cultures and traditions. Mm. You know, how do you explain Santa if the culture is from a, 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 the figure is from a culture different from your own? So certainly Christmas could be a time of kind of colliding of cultures, can't it? Mm, I think it can, but I mean, on the other hand, as I said, it, it, it's all from very ancient ideas of getting you through those dank, dark months um, mm. until spring is coming, and that's what, you know, the candles are all about. Um, they mimic, um, you know, the bugs on fir trees, and I think yeah. people instinctively know this. It's, a, it's actually about celebrating rebirth in all sorts of ways and in all sorts of cultures. Um, yeah. And so I think that's why we want to do it. And that's why we have these lovely fantasies. I mean, you know, Santa Claus, it's a, it's a lovely idea of spreading cheer, of, of, of actually helping other people, um, giving gifts to other people and, and being kind to other people. Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of people there looking at the poll results, enjoying giving and sharing. Mm -hmm. But for the vast majority, taking the, the family time in a good way, option came up high and you know it's a very interesting one because it's a real kind of mixed blessing isn't it you know a lot of what we'll be unpacking as we go forward are the challenges represented by family being kind of hot house together at this time but you know somehow deep down we we, we crave that so that's, that's interesting and many thanks indeed for taking part in that poll so we'll move on to some of the information that you shared when you signed up for the webinar how are you going to spend this time? So 82% of, uh, of you said that it would be a fairly traditional time. We've got well over 100 registered for the webinar. So you know that's what we're looking at in terms of a fairly big sample. So that's interesting that you know we talked about whether a modern Christmas is different in, in what we said we'd address. Well, some of you um, have some different takes on it. But the vast majority, whatever fairly traditional may mean, that's what you're kind of going for. Some away on holiday some with our own novel version, um, and, and some perhaps doing nothing out of the ordinary, which may equate to fairly traditional. But um, panel, do we think Christmas is, is changing? I think um, with families these days, there, there's a lot of different issues around who's going to be with you, if you call it a family day. Um, for myself, um, I'm a single parent, and that does sometimes mean that my children aren't with me over the whole of the Christmas period. Um, so for me, it's about managing that in particular. Yeah, thank you, Harriet. And I think that must be a key point for, for many people. So families perhaps are maybe more blended and less predictable in shape than perhaps they were when, when we felt obliged to kind of carry on in the same track whether or not things were working. So, so there could be a level of complexity and a level of jangling mm. of our emotions relating to that. Um, the emotion bit is important because it's, yeah. um, you know, it's not just the logistics of, of, as you say, of being in different places, of having children perhaps spread around and, and, and each parent sees them for part of the time and therefore doesn't see them for part of the time. But it's the emotions that go with that. And it's mm -hmm. mixing up things like having, you know, maybe two sets of children from two different families coming Completely. together. Completely. I think we'll come back to that, won't we, Susie, as we go mm. forward. Um, so the main hopes that you have for this festive season, 65% hoping to feel festive and celebratory. Um, just 
you know, some of you happy to get on in a dignified way, which is a kind of nice <laughs> British concept, a multicultural British concept, I'm sure. Um, just get through it. And indeed, you know, there were some heartfelt comments on the registration form of really not liking Christmas and just kind of hoping that it'll go away quite quickly. And, you know, we recognize for some people it is, it is a tough time. Um, we don't want to make light of that. But um, for some, it's a time when, you know, there'll be highs and lows, and, and let's see if we can maximize the highs, including some time for me, which was the aspiration of, of some of you. Mm. Um, key concerns include living up to our own high standards, so kind of uh, unsurprisingly large yeah. group of us feel pressure in that regard. Um, so that's that's an interesting one which we'll return to. Oh, that's true. I'm really struck by that one as well, just in terms of what you were saying earlier about Christmas starting so early in terms of the pressures. Mm. And it kind of, it, it's good, kind of it feels like a machine sometimes to me. Um, of, of almost like this rolling pressure and building up to be, you know, some great event. And uh, as you say, I'm sure a lot of that comes from a personal angle, wanting to make it great. Yeah, I think that's so right, Amanda. And our, our marketing director was saying to me this morning that her mum always used to say, "It's only one day." Exactly. But boy, do we get a day with the spotlight on it. <laughs> my mum <laughs> says that to me, and then she says, "And by the way, darling, can you get all of your children presents from me and post them in wrap them?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. It's officially only the one day, but in fact, you know, there is that whole holiday period. You know, you want to make Christmas Eve special. Christmas Day special, Boxing Day, and then the days in between until New Year. The whole thing's got to be, you know, quite marked in some way. I feel. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's not 12 days when you think about it. I mean, if you if, if you actually break up, and of course there'll be some families now that stop on the Friday, have the mm -hmm. weekend, Christmas Eve on a Monday, then the Christmas break. You know, you're going right the way through to, to New Year's Day. That long period. I mean, I get so many letters to women from people who are feeling that long period. I'm just feeling stressed now you're saying that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's have a look at some of the things that, that people specifically highlighted, because there's, there's quite a, a, a large group there looking at how to entertain children being a, a concern, as well as managing other people's expectations. But let's unpick mm -hmm. some of the actual um, wording that people kindly typed in, and then we'll go on to, to some kind of advice and, and reflection on, on how we could do things differently. So just very briefly, looking at what participants have typed in. So it's, it's the over-sugared children, it's the awkwardness about, you know, whether children are going to perform in front of grandparents, um, keeping them perhaps to, to the, the family values that we might hold dear, you know, is it okay to be texting over the roast turkey or is that kind of just a bit too much? Um, and also, you know, as we've already touched upon, the really understandable pressures, especially during a, a time of recession, to to make Christmas special when a lot of that can cost quite a lot of money. So rather than unpacking those in great detail now, we'll definitely return to those. Um, but we're going to go on and have a look at some of the other themes that you raised. So who do you spend Christmas with? Trying to see everybody, um, perhaps showing off children to all sorts of people that want to, to see that child, juggling between different families, um, and juggling the guilt that, that goes with that saying no or, you know, extensive traveling. Um, and Harriet, I know, you know, as you were saying, some of that comes, and, and Susie was underlining, with a, a kind of emotional pull as well, doesn't it, when families are separated in, in different directions? Yes. I mean, I think it's a question of maybe when you know your child's going to be away, setting something that's actually you time, so something positive to focus on rather than, you know, the danger of hitting the cherry brandy or whatever on Boxing Day. You know, set yourself a task, something to complete, something you can feel at the end of the day you've achieved, whether that's, you know, just putting your feet up and watching a film or doing a bit of gardening or um, going out with friends. Yeah. Thank you, Harriet. Um, we've got a few questions coming in, which is brilliant. Several on, on you know, having grown up with a family that was remarrying or, or being divorced and, and the challenges of that, which we really recognize. Somebody raising that all the panel are female on the webinar and are all the participants female. Well, I, I don't know that we um, have a sense of, of how many participants are female. We normally, on the My Family Care Work and Family Space webinars, we normally get quite a, a blend of people and um, my colleagues just showing me the list and there's a lot of male names on that list I can assure you we often have at least one male panelist but it just kind of worked out this way that it was all 
um, women who uh, took up our invitation to join, but point taken. Um, and I think Christmas can be very stressful for dads too, or, or, or guys generally. Amanda, were you trying to say? Well, that? I was just thinking, you know, maybe it's a good thing because maybe the guys are out there because we've delegated brilliantly instead of taking control over over controlling, which is my tendency. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they're all out there buying trees or something, but they're probably not. It, it, it's actually, interesting you mentioned <laughs> buying trees because there was a wonderful article. It was over 10 years ago now, but I, I unearthed it recently. Somebody called Guy Browning, you may know, who, who wrote a piece in the um, Guardian, How to Survive Your Family, all about Christmas. And he it was a wonderfully witty piece. And he was saying that the main job of a, a dad is to go and get the tree. And then he said three things that dads have to remember once they've sorted the tree is <laughs> that, that at any point during Christmas, they, if they're not preparing vegetables, they should be washing up. If they're not doing either of those, they should be bringing in crates drink from the shed, mince pies from the freezer, and elderly relatives from Wolverhampton. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, there can be, uh, women often have a moan about the pressures. It's an important issue because yeah. this is, uh, the letters I get on Woman's Own about, you know, from women who are, who are really stressed and unhappy and, and bemoaning the fact that they seem to end up doing all the work. Mm. And one of the things I often say to them, here's a solution, is that, yes, it does tend to happen because we traditionally almost have been the ones who have done the emotional family stuff. Mm -hmm. So many men actually would love to take part, but they feel incompetent. Give them chores. And I think it's yeah. really important, actually. You just, you know, you mentioned delegation. Well, you know, don't let them do the delegating. You do the delegating as the woman in the center of the family. Um, mm -hmm. And start handing out, okay, you know, you're in charge of this, you're in charge of that. And when people arrive for dinner, make it very clear that, you know, afterwards with the washing up, that's your job, that's your job, and that's your job. And I think sometimes we cut our own throat by playing the martyr and doing all the work and then, you know, complaining about it afterwards. We need to actually spread that stuff around and then we don't have anything to complain about. Absolutely. And the, the slide I've just put up, relatives and relationships, a lot of people talking about marital tensions, mm. arguments, you know, and a lot of that comes about, I guess, through what we might call kind of passive aggressive communication in the home where we don't openly own up to needs and feelings but there's a lot of huffing and puffing and slamming of doors about mm. things that should have been totally obvious. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not. People can't read your mind. Yeah. You yeah. need to plan beforehand of what needs to be done. How can you spread that around? How can you be clear? And thinking about the trigger points. What are the things last year and the year before that set you up and upset you? What can you do this time to actually, rather than hoping it's not going to happen again, what can you actually do, um, you know, to head it off to the past? And it is so often possible to head off your resentments to the past if you recognize they're going to happen again. Absolutely. So we're also, you know, concerned about ourselves, sort of worrying that either we'll have to do all the hard work, worrying about maintaining energy levels, mm. you know, dealing with the, the kind of overload that follows the celebrations, and also the kind of keeping up appearances, and this is definitely something that we'll return to as we go through, but, you know, a lot of quite specific points there, and other points are being shared through questions. There was somebody raising the question of, of Santa and whether we, we kind of fess up to, to who Santa is. I think we should probably return to that definitely at a, at a certain point as we go forward. Um, but people talking here on questions about Christmas bringing um, raw emotions, which we're, we're absolutely just about to, to acknowledge as well. Um, some of you shared in the registration process that you know, if there's been a bereavement or somebody lost um, through death, and that can also be perhaps somebody lost through a relationship breakdown, then Christmas can seem a particularly raw time, and, and we're going to come on to discuss that a little bit more in, in a few minutes. But you know, we're acknowledging that there's a whole raft of, of emotions and experiences here at play. Um, some of the other ways that some of you are going to spend Christmas this year, holiday abroad, being invited to a friend's restaurant, which apparently involved quite a staggering driving distance, but um, but none, nonetheless perhaps a bit less cooking, um, or you know, perhaps spending it on your own, or indeed working, somebody um, typed in. So I don't know whether that's a positive way out from Christmas or, or not. Um, you know, it answers on a postcard perhaps from, from your holiday next year. Um, <laughs> so, but one of the things we wanted to invite you to do is to think about sometimes it's easier looking at somebody else's situation to have it all sorted. You know, obviously they should do this, they could do this. And sometimes harder to see right under our own noses. So here's a, a kind of little vignette of somebody who's, who's struggling a little bit with, with her Christmas situation. 
and and if any of you can't see the slides at home, you may be just dialed in without the slides. I'll I'll just read it out. So don't get me started on Christmas. But how is it that it's all down to me? Shouldn't be a surprise though, because it's pretty much down to me every other day of the year. It seems to be a kind of punishment for not having worked hard enough the rest of the year. Then she says her favourite day is going to be the twelfth day when it all gets packed up. Don't get don't get me wrong. I love traditions, but honestly, I'm fed up with putting the tree up on my own. So she says she feels like a fool because the kids are growing and they don't any longer really want the tree, but they'd notice if it was missing. And my other half, she says, well, last year I pulled out all the stops, even put tinsel on his mother's Zimmer frame for him. And I wrapped about a million sprouts in bits of bacon for his huge family to consume, huge in every way. And he didn't get round to thinking of buying me anything more original than the usual set of underwear. Very nice, I'm sure, but a comfy pair of slippers and a warm bath would do for me. So a <laughs> bit of a moan there, a bit of a sort of don't get me started. And we've got some ideas as a panel on, on what we could pull out from there, but we'd like to hear first from you. What would you do next? And we're going to give you one option. What would you tackle first? What's the kind of priority to start with here? If you had a range of, of options that we're launching now, which would you actually tackle? And feel free to type in if there's something altogether that you would do, you know, like um, clear off to the Caribbean or whatever, money permitting, please feel free to type that in. There's somebody just um, typed in a, a question that I'm, I'm trying to get the hang of here. It's, it's not about getting presents. So the person here is saying that they're not religious and don't attend church, so not sure where to start. Um, I guess, yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? If you have a religious celebration at the heart of Christmas, then you, you have a structure. Um, and if you don't have that, then in some ways you're free to, to make it up. And I don't know whether there are pressures from sometimes other family members then to sustain a tradition that you might not particularly buy into. I don't know, Amanda, if you've got any sense of, of those different I, pressures. I think it's a really interesting question and I think individual families often create over time their own culture in their own way and I, and I, I mean I always think of the word culture as just how we do things around here and it may be based on religion, it may just be just how we like to do it as a family and, and I think yeah, there's, there are some of the most special traditions and, uh, and ways of doing things when you talk to, to when I talk to friends uh, and how they do it, you know, have often evolved almost by accident but become quite entrenched in, in the way families do it and that, that, that can be, I think, quite a nice thing, you know, when people talk about doing things in a traditional way, I think it means different things for everybody. Absolutely. Well, somebody's just typed in that um, they have to say Christmas improved once they became a Christian. Um, mm. So, if, and if you're not religious, why not try volunteering to feel more connected? That's a lovely idea, lovely. you know, helping in a night shelter or something like that. So it, it kind of connects with the essential sense of giving, which whether it's a humanitarian thing or a, a, a Christian thing for, or another religious thing for any of us, um, we could certainly feel, you know, some sort of Christmas spirit through doing that, I'm sure. Mm. So we're going to close the poll now and, and share the results, which we can't wait to see. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, so there's quite a strong vote in favor of, of letting every family member choose a tradition to carry on themselves. So if, if we really think the teenagers want the Christmas tree, then perhaps the teenagers choose to host the tree and, and take that forward. Um, Good vote in favour of taking some time out, explaining that and being precise, you know, rather than moaning sort of, oh, nobody cares about me, yeah. being kind of concrete and specific about, now I'm going to go and have a lie down or, you know, walk around the block. Um, so what do we think, panel, about that? What, Harriet, what was your reaction? Well, my first reaction to this poor lady was, why on earth doesn't she verbalise how she's feeling? <laughs> I mean, it's so easy to internalise these things. Um, and it's almost as if she was expecting everybody to understand how she was feeling and automatically jump to it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, my message would be, please, please tell somebody how you're feeling. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, yeah, I think it's, it's terrible. Sometimes, as I said, you almost get a kick out of being the master mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. realizing it would actually feel a lot better if you would sit down and say, right, this is what I feel and this is why and what I would like. I have a mantra. Um, I call it the mantra because I think you, you should learn it and then it can flow off your lips very, very easily. And that is that you say, when, such and such happens, when everybody's enjoying themselves and I'm doing all the work, I feel, I feel rejected, I feel, you know, whatever, I feel angry, upset, resentful, because, and you explain, you know, what, what's going on here, what I would like is, and the what I would like is, 
um, you know, how about you doing some chores? How about us talking about it? The number of times people, when they verbalize it, as you say, the other person says, I never realized. I'm so sorry. Mm. I thought you enjoyed doing this. I thought you wanted to do it. I thought you didn't want me in the kitchen because you thought I would be a nuisance. Mm -hmm. um, you'd be surprised how people would like to help if only given the option to do so. Absolutely. Mm. And the presence buying issue. Somebody's just typed in that after 15 years, my partner gives me money instead of um, <laughs> a present that you need. Know, oh, that. I wanted but to leap on that one. I have to say, Jennifer, because I spent years doing the not verbalizing my slight disappointment about presents and, and hoping to be, you know, very brilliantly surprised by some amazing thing. And I just thought, you know what? Why don't I just kind of go and say exactly what I want? And yeah. And I've been delighted ever since with my presence. <laughs> so I feel like, like that. Oh, look at that. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Well, oh, I, I'm much like more specific. I say I'd like to. I'm, I'm in a shop. I've seen something. I'd love you to buy for me, and I buy it. <laughs> <laughs> it can be done. I'm Absolutely. very happy. Gift lists. So somebody typing in now to so sharing gift list lists, and mm. everybody picks a couple of things. A bit like organising a wedding. It's cracking idea if your family's up for that kind of We culture. do that in our family. We do it very specifically. And actually, it's lovely because we agree budgets. We send out lists for everybody, and, and uh, then and people are happy. It, it can feel sometimes a little bit, you know, I don't know. I think when we first did it, it felt a bit uncomfortable. It's not, you know, because no one wants to be asking for something, so it doesn't feel terribly uh, in the right spirit. But, you know, getting just getting really practical when you've got a big family, it works brilliantly. Mm -hmm. Well, here's an idea of your internet. If everybody sort of, you know, can work the internet, and that is that Amazon have, you know, a wish list section. And you can enter anything mm -hmm. you like into it. So I've got a big, long list there of books I want, DVDs I want, presents, all sorts of odd things that I have seen. Um, that are you know available on the internet and, and are on that list, and people can go in and say to my family, go and have a look. Um, I'm just waiting for people to start typing in about boycotting Amazon this year for those <laughs> oh, reasons. Yeah. But you know, it's a, it's a personal view on, on whether you do or you don't. So um, <laughs> somewhere, but have a list somewhere that people can access. <laughs> Absolutely, and you know, one more thing I just wanted to pick up on in in this little vignette here, the the kind of present giving here. You know, I think what's happening because there's such a, a dearth of communication going on, a huge build up of resentment. What Amanda often refers to as the burning martyr situation. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, here's the, the 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 husband with the best will in the world buying this underwear, in, you know, hoping to to kind yeah. of bring about a certain romantic feeling, and the woman's yeah. saying, you know, that's the last thing. And I, there is a way in which, isn't there, if we are not communicating and not clear about our needs, we can end up with quite big rifts developing over stuff that we really didn't want to, to kind of fall out over. But it's, it's just, you know, it can go it can go quite deep, can't it, really, what, what, what goes on? Deeply. I mean, yes, we've all, I think we've all dealt with count clients who have had years and years of resentment and unhappiness and misery, which could have actually been undercut so quickly and easily if only people had talked. Absolutely, absolutely. So, great. Many thanks indeed for taking part in that poll. Um, so, what do we do? How do you manage it going forward? Well, it's all relative, <laughs> at least as far as your comments on registration are concerned. A lot of it is to do with the relatives. Um, so we're going to touch on some of the things that we might do differently in these, these different areas of, of, of different relatives, whether it's, it's grandparents or drunken uncles um, <laughs> or in-laws with, with different views on, on work-life balance or in-laws that don't help out and just sit there. You know, but some of you shared that you know, maybe there are kind of difficult situations about relationships that have, have fallen apart, but you, know, you need to get back together for the sake of the wider family. Um, and, and you know, maintain a united front. Some of you are, are you know, experiencing perhaps overbearing parents with their own views, and some of you are wrestling with being single and then you know, perhaps either wanting or not wanting to spend Christmas on your own, but also being pulled in different directions. If, if you're single, everyone assumes you're free to go and visit them. Um, but before we unpack some of those a little bit further, who will you have around the table or around the TV or however you're going to gather on the 25th of December this year. We only had five options in the, the polling system, so apologies, it's a little bit um, generic. So perhaps you're, you're not catering for others, or you have just the one generation of yourself and possibly a partner or friend. Um, two generations, you and small children. Two generations, you and older children. Um, or you have older relatives, and that might mean you've therefore got three generations, or just you grown up or grown ups 
and older relatives. So let's hear who you've got around the around the table. But just um, coming back to to some of those themes with you, which we're going to to unpack in a minute. Certainly, the issue of grandparents seems to crop up quite a lot. Either grandparents giving too too many presents, or grandparents mm. wanting to be the ones in the spotlight and nobody else getting a look in. Yeah, yeah. I think grandparents are hugely important to families, and they're wonderful. Um, they are so useful to children to have that sort of you know next generation, or often grandchildren and grandparents actually can meet where parents and children can't. So they're wonderful to, to have. But yes, yeah, sometimes there's such a gap between what grandparents expect of, the, of children, the, the, the rules they, they, they think should be kept. Absolutely. And they often want to, as you say, it's almost particularly grandparents who live a, a long distance away. They, it's not that they, but they're trying to buy love, but they're trying to make up for the fact that they're not there. And they could be buying presents, showering children with presents that the, the parents are not happy about. And indeed, if there is a step issue going on, a step family going on, you can have a dreadful situation of one child given lots of presents and another child not, because the grandparent doesn't consider that child to be one of theirs. Mm. So I think there's an awful lot of issues there that, that really do need communication between Absolutely. the concerns. But often that's the problem, they don't. Yes. Susie, I've just had somebody type in a question to say that it's quite difficult to hear you. That's not the case at my end, but if, if you can possibly hold the phone a bit closer or, or, or that would be great. Thank you. Um, so a couple of people have typed in that they've got, you know, four brothers and three sisters and so on all, all seated around the table and, and perhaps a few pets thrown in for good measure. Um, but somebody's also typed in that they're, they're being asked to buy presents for a brother's girlfriend that they've never met and, and how do we do that? So there can be a few challenges about that and I guess it comes back to possibly you could ask um, ask the opinion of, of the brother or, or, or so on but I can see there's a fair few people have got the, uh, the classic kind of several generations or older relatives present so that's that's really helpful information thank you and some of you are managing to avoid the catering altogether and visiting others so uh, that's <laughs> rather that wonderful. Happens. You don't have the leftovers. <laughs> it's true, there's a downside. That, that could be a real problem if you go out to a restaurant, for instance, wonderful on the day, mm. but um, no leftovers the next day. And an awful lot of people, I think Christmas, is, the best thing about it is, is you know, being able to have um, fried Christmas pudding with your bacon on, on Boxing Day morning. <laughs> <Bubbly with Greek. laughs> Great. Well, indeed, what can we do about managing some of these pressures? We've, we've already shared quite a lot of, of insight and, and ideas as we've gone along so far. But Amanda, I know you're particularly keen on the idea of, of keeping a sense of perspective and also being aware of how we perceive the challenges and, and you know, a challenge for one could be a delight for another. Yes, I was really struck by this actually um, last Christmas when I was in the throes of preparing a big, big party actually for lots of, um, lots of friends that live locally. And I was also um, went on the following week to be making lots of pies and things with lots of relatives coming. And my friend said to me, you make Christmas as, about as stressful as you could ever make it. And she said that all of that catering and, you know, making your homemade parmesan crisps, and she was really mocking me and saying that sounds absolutely ghastly and she'd rather pull her fingernails out. <laughs> and I was really thinking about this and thinking, actually, that's a bit I love. Mm. And so that didn't feel at all stressful. It felt absolutely gorgeous to be able to do that. The, the bit that I found hugely stressful was the bit before that, it was kind of getting to that place and all the, all the shopping and the, and the coordinating of the presents already said, you know, end up buying for both sets of parents uh, on, on behalf of them for my children and so on. And it's that build up, which often combines with work pressures building up towards Christmas um, and children finishing school and so on and so forth. That's the bit for me. So I guess it's about how we're viewing a situation and for each of us that will be slightly different. Mm -hmm. And it also occurs to me that it's helpful sometimes if we're finding something stressful, you know, could we find a slightly different way of viewing it that might feel yeah. better? So perhaps Thanks, slightly Amanda. shifting, yeah. And actually on that point, somebody's just typed in that their mother, whose birthday also happens to be on Christmas Day, is oh. choosing to spend that alone due to certain sort of family, wider family um, tensions. And actually, you know, in a way, perhaps the fact that the mother has chosen to spend that on, on her own, we might awfulize that in our minds and assume that's a really bad thing. But you know what? She might she might have a very <laughs> peaceful <laughs> day. <laughs> My mum said she would love to spend Christmas on her own, and I genuinely believe she would. 
Um, my father wouldn't, so there's always this problem. But uh, I think that you're absolutely right. It's about how we, you know, uh, how we all view it. And absolutely. Um, coming back to the point about money, because several of the tips that I've got on the screen at the moment about sort of saying no and, and, and being fair and so on, we've, we've kind of covered. Um, but the money one, I mean, sometimes I know, Susie, from things that you've written, you're, you're quite keen to emphasize that if we're honest, you know, with, yeah. with teenagers who may want three Xboxes and a pair of Nike trainers, that they would still respect us if we're honest with them and help them to understand the cost of things. I can't think of a better gift you could give your children than the ability to manage money in the future. Not to think that, you know, with a wave of a wand it will appear there'll always be someone to give you something. You know, Father Christmas will always be there. Parents will always be there. I think it's a really important thing to help children at quite an early age to recognize budgets and priorities and choices. And to know that, you know, if, if, they've, if they've asked for things and you're saying no, it's not because you're mean and nasty and hate them, <laughs> or because they've been bad, but the quiz, because there's a reality about finances here. I think it's really important to talk to children. And you can play a game with young children. You can do a shopping game um, where, you know, before Christmas, what you do, before they write their list, is you have a little game about we're going to the shops to buy. We have to buy food. We have to buy an outfit. We have to do all these things. So what you teach them is there's a limit to how much you've got and maybe, you know, um, uh, putting things together, several children, um, you know, pooling their resources, that sort of stuff would work. And then when the Christmas list comes, you can actually say, remember the game, it's the same sort of thing. We haven't got mm -hmm. enough to cover everything. How are we going to do this? And then when they get to teenagers, you know, they understand this. You can ask them to go and have holiday jobs if there's something expensive they want. They'll understand that, you, you know, what it means is for you, in a sense, to set aside your pride of being the parent who can do everything and supply everything and talk to them about reality. Yes, and I think it's yeah. worth reminding ourselves that the presents will soon be forgotten. I mean, yes. probably by, by next Christmas, they won't even mm. remember what you gave them. Um, and it's more about quality time and what they'll take yes. forward and bring to their own family traditions when they're adults. Indeed. That's, I think time yeah, together. Thank you, Harriet. Yes, and there's a lovely um, point just being typed in. Somebody's typed, one mum I heard of was using second-hand gifts, obviously, you know, that saves some money, and, and told the children that the elves had been a little bit naughty and had played with them already. <laughs> oh, so that's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> pre-owned, I love that phrase, pre-owned. Yeah. Pre-owned yeah. and pre-loved. Pre-loved, yeah. Um, must draw attention to a, a fantastic tip shared by Kristen in the office, our social media manager, allocating Christmas jobs in crackers. Apparently this goes on in her family. People get their jobs in a Wonderful. Christmas cracker. Um, so, I mean, you can do a little bit of forward planning that you don't get the three-year-old to cook the turkey or something. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Add out the teenager's job, the small children's job. Brilliant idea. <laughs> so that's rather rather brilliant. And, and yeah, finding the moments in between, many of us will be rushing from one thing to another and it will feel quite hectic and perhaps overwhelming and energy might be at a, at a premium. You know, where can I find just a few minutes in the day? And if, if there are a few minutes where I'm alone and I, I don't know, step out into the fresh air or even just pop to the loo, you know, if I can go and stand in another room and take a moment and instead of running through the list of things I've failed to do or how really annoying Uncle Joe was this year, you know, just take a moment to kind of relax my shoulders, breathe out, identify some nice things that have happened and, and reflect on those, then I'm, I'm going to really do my well-being a lot of favors by, by doing that. And, and they're helping children to do the same. I mean, one of the questions I often get asked is about teenagers wanting to see their friends over the Christmas mm -hmm. period. Um, and I had one recently, you know, but their grandparents are coming for the day and want them to be there for the whole day because I hardly see them. And I think what I was saying back was, well, you know, quality time is the most important thing. If you've got teenagers who are quite delighted to spend Christmas lunch with you, um, and knowing that in the evening they can go and see their friends, and then you can actually have your quality time with your parents, mm -hmm. much better situation than insisting that these sulky teenagers are not allowed to go out. Yes, absolutely, Susie. And we're just coming on to a slide called Step Families here, and I think we'll very briefly touch on this because it's not the, the issue for everybody, but it kind of touches on sort of blended families, separated families. There are a few points to remember, aren't there, briefly in relation to Step Families, Susie? I think so. I mean, I think it's about recognizing that everybody has needs and wishes and you have to sort of give a little bit to everybody. Um, it's very easy when you're the parent stuck in the middle to think, I want my children to stay with me, the other person's no longer here, you know, that's it. 
recognise what the children need and they need contact with all their family. But I think to talk about it beforehand and work it out beforehand, because it may be that the children spread their time between different families over that particular break. You know, mm -hmm. one place on Christmas Day, one place on Christmas Eve, one place on Boxing Day. Or it may be that you say this year the family is with this, you know, the, the children are with this part of the family, next year they're with the other part of the family. Whatever works for you, but you have to plan it beforehand. I think that's the important thing. Absolutely, and the points on the, the screen are points that I took from a, an article you'd written on, on set mm. families, and one of them which really struck me was see the child behind the behavior, because in a, in a step family that often signifies people have come from some kind of, of breakup or, or loss, and, and they yeah. may be playing up, and there may be yeah. good reasons for that, and it's important to, certainly we can dislike the behavior if they're exactly. be tearing down the Christmas tree, but yeah. trying to see the kind of whole child. person. Yeah. Said, if you have a stepchild that is behaving badly, sulkily, you know, causing problems, having tantrums, what's going on is what they're probably actually saying is, my original family is no longer together and I'm really hurt about that. And yes, this is a wonderful festive time and maybe even the new family I'm in actually is better for me, but actually I'm upset about the breakup. And I think it's understanding the grief and the loss um, that's underneath bad behavior. Bad behavior is never just about being naughty, it's about expressing an unhappiness. And sometimes it's all you have to say is to say to a child, you know, you, you must be missing your dad or your mum, or you must be missing what it, what it used to be like. And just saying that sometimes actually makes a tremendous difference. Absolutely. So it's the acknowledgement and yeah. kind of diffusing the situation the and mm. suddenly uh, enabling it to, to be about human emotions that we all feel rather than you're doing this, which is exactly. really inconvenient for and me. And you're a bad child. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, also, as, as we touched on earlier, you know, this is a time when we, we sometimes feel very acutely the loss of someone that, that we've loved and that we miss, whether that's because they've died or, or whether because relationships have changed and moved on. So I know, Amanda, I mean, you have a lot of experience of supporting bereavement and, and the, the power of, of acknowledging that and honoring that, haven't you? Yes, I think there are lots of ways of doing it. I think one of the most important things is that it is acknowledged in some way, because otherwise it really is. I mean, obviously, we will hear the expression "the elephant in the room," but it really can become that. And I think that uh, you know, it's lovely if it can be that, that the person that's missing can be can be acknowledged. I'm thinking really about somebody, a member of the family, um, or, or friend who's died. And I think that sometimes <coughs> I've known, excuse me, some some families. Uh, Kind of separate it slightly from the, the the traditions of family, and maybe go and visit visit the grave, or, or just have a moment to reflect on it in a slightly separate way. So, uh, a very close friend of mine actually, um, her first baby died, but the whole family every single year on Christmas Eve go and visit the grave of the of the baby that died. And she's had gone on to have more children, and they all go, and it's part of the family, and it's knowledge, and it's become part of their family tradition. But it's you know it's it's it, 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 it's acknowledged rather than ignored. Um, Absolutely, yeah. and somebody's just typed in about having perhaps treasures in a shoebox. Um, so you know, mm. uh, using that as, as something to remember them as a as a person. So you could have something that that kind of focuses those memories, or indeed you could create a ritual. You know, anything as simple as going out to drop a flower into a river, or you know, whatever it may be that that would have some some personal meaning. Whether it's a focusing on those memories of that person, or carrying out some combined ritual that could have meaning for, for you um, and others that might be part of that. So um, certainly, rather than pretending it's, it's not there, I know there can be quite a lot of kind of anger and resentment if we feel other family members are moving on too swiftly. Um, and so I think people were rather frightened of, get, uh, of having people cry and be sad. We want mm -hmm. it to be a happy time. And I think what we often forget is that if you try and suppress sadness, actually it's worse. It gets worse. It festers. Far yeah. better to raise the issue. Maybe have a few tears, and then we can actually move on. So I think the idea of the of the, of the box, of the um, the memory box, wonderful thing perhaps to bring out. You know, to sort of for lunch and do round the table. So well, even yeah. yeah. I was thinking of the first year after my sister-in-law died at the yeah. table when my parents and all were there, and and we we just before we started Christmas, we all drank a toast to 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 Jill, and that was absolutely lovely, and it was completely acknowledged. And you know, we we got we were all sad, and then we we carried on, and we were okay with the lunch. And it, but it, I think it is about acknowledging it and uh, and, and, and as you say, servicing it. Mm, absolutely. Um, we just had a question unrelated to, to this topic, but a, a lovely point that was just been raised. Um, somebody who, who's married into a medical family and they have a tradition of visiting local hospitals in their mm. family at Christmas to wish everyone a happy Christmas. So again, it's a little bit like the comment earlier of, of volunteering, sure. you know, if to take ourselves out of perhaps 
sort of frustrations or sadness that we may feel to to think of other people that, that might be alone and, and sharing that greeting is rather wonderful. Mm -hmm. Um, so on to the, the minor embarrassments, our, our little darlings that quite a lot of people were, um, were kind of concerned about, you know, are they going to, to let us down in front of the relatives uh, and so on. Um, and I think, you know, there's an emotional and a practical side to this. Emotionally, I remember, um, you know, times of, of dealing way back, my sons are now 12 and 9, so it's doesn't tend to happen now quite so much, but you know tantrums in the supermarket, and, yeah. and I remember at the time, you know, as a coach, thinking to myself, this is this is a growth opportunity. You know, if I can get used to not worrying about what people think here, that this is good for my maturity. And you know, some of it is about that, isn't it? About you know letting our our own mother's perfectionism be her issue rather than than ours. And then there's a practical side, which perhaps we'll come on to. But certainly, Amanda, I know you're. You're a keen advocate of, of not buying in too much to perfectionism, aren't you? Yes, I was thinking about uh, well, of that. In my mind, there was so was so focused on that child having a tantrum. I think I'm still thinking about that one actually, as you as you speak, and uh, thinking about what we were just saying about uh, behaviour. You know, yes, children can pay up, and yes, it can be uh, very embarrassing and awkward. Um, but I also think it's also about just, you know saying what is and isn't acceptable. So I think we can we can uh, want everything to be perfect, yes, and we can also want our children to behave in a certain way, and they don't. Um, but I think they need boundaries. I'm thinking about small children and and uh, and teenagers here. Yeah. Um, I yeah. so agree with that. I mean, I so agree with, with the fact that you can draw lines in the sand and say to very small children, right way up to teenagers, this is the way we behave in this family. Yes, and this is but, not okay. This is what you're doing is not okay. Not okay. Yeah. But in some ways appealing to their better nature as well, because yeah. children, they want to please. Um, exactly. Yeah. So, so you reward you know, them when they behave well. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But also, but there has to be the but, which is just asking yourself, is this about something else? And so mm -hmm. sometimes when kids, kids take off, particularly if it's something like a step family around Christmas, yeah. it's actually about that grief and loss which needs to be acknowledged before yeah. you can then go on to, you know, to say, but we don't behave in this. Yeah, so I think that's the bit that, that I think uh, it, you know, it's important to remind ourselves of. Yeah, it, you have to be right acknowledging it and then, and then saying, and this, and this isn't okay. Yeah. And then on the practical side, depending on the age of the children, I think it, it's important to maintain a routine. Um, so things yeah. like bedtimes don't go by the by and oh, yeah. have regular meals and not too many sugary drinks, mm. et cetera, et cetera. I so agree with that. And I think that sometimes we do think we're doing our children a favour by letting all the routines go out the window. Mm. Around about all the children need a routine. I'm thinking about parents here as well, how much we might overdose on the sugar and the alcohol. Yes. <laughs> and then we can behave badly too. <laughs> well, you have to be a good model. That's another thing, of course, modelling. You can't yeah. expect a ticking teenager to behave well and not get drunk. <laughs> no. If, if we're doing it, so it's always think about your, your own behavior. But I'll tell you another thing I feel very strongly about about Christmas. You know, you've already raised this bit about, you know, what do we do? How do we entertain them? And you talk here about, you know, being bored is not a life-threatening illness. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's so important to not feel as parents and as adults that we're running around entertaining our children and having to think about such things for them. What about them? What about this being their chore, throw it in their lap? What would you like to do? Let's have a family time. Let's do it around the table together. But you come up with the ideas, and actually they can, you know, they can come up with wonderful ideas mm -hmm. and feel part of it and empowered if it is given to them as a job. And I know so many kids who would love to be able to say, I want to play Monopoly or something like that. They actually don't want to go to their rooms and play on their, you know, their, 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 their machines. They actually want to be with the family doing stuff mm -hmm. like that. And I think at Christmas with grandparents there and yep. an extended family, that's often a, a wonderful opportunity to, oh, to yeah. make that happen. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And just just one further point on, on the little darlings before we move on. <laughs> you know, a lot of people were worried about managing the over-sugared outbursts, whether mm. ours or the children's. But, I mean, one thing that's worth saying is, you know, it, it's several times worse to, to, to sort of shout at one's children in front of one's own parents. You know, there's all sorts of stuff that we feel we're letting ourselves down on when, when that happens in, in both directions. So, you know, if, if we feel that there's some disciplining or, or kind of negotiation that needs to take place, I mean disciplining in a, a sort of, you know, talking it through firmly way, then, then we, you know, one option is to take that child out into another room so that we don't have to 
to be watched by by older relatives doing that. So you know, there's a kind of discretion, isn't there? If we can kind of level with the children eye to eye in a calmer atmosphere, there's more mm. chance of resolving it. Well. Yeah. And I guess the same applies to teens, Susie, where, you know, mm. there's often a, a question of the teens, teenagers saying, you know, you just don't listen, and, and sometimes mm. we realize perhaps we're we not don't. doing, and, and perhaps we're becoming our own parents in an attempt to, to kind of <laughs> regiment them. <laughs> I, I can remember the day that I was actually having a sounding off to my lovely husband about, about his son, about my stepson, about something, and I suddenly heard my mother's voice and thought, mm. oh my goodness, no, I don't want to do this, and went back to him and apologized about the particular issue. And we then started really communicating. I think this is it. You've got to listen to The way you deal with teenagers is not the same as you deal with children. With children, you're far more than you know, the person you guide and the person perhaps who has that experience. With teenagers, you have to negotiate. You have to listen. And I think particularly around this time of year, yes, you want them to be in the family, but I think you also want to give them the option to at least communicate with their friends and perhaps sometimes to step outside. Um, and, you know, that, that's about sitting around the table beforehand and saying, right, what do you want out of Christmas? Um, you know, what would you like to do and, and how would you like to come in? And you'll find if given the option, they'll probably say, oh, no, what to do with you? But they'll struggle to escape if you don't give them the option because they've got to make their own point, you know, and they'll be standing there and two feet because they're teenagers. Yes, and I think teens sometimes almost feel a bit obliged to misbehave and not quite join in the party, but mm, I think, uncle. you know, ha having a son in, in his early 20s now and having gone through that, mm. um, it's usually just a phase, and in fact then they come full circle and can really start enjoying Christmases once they mm. hit early adulthood. Mm. And I think the more you respect their wishes to, to be cool and not be mm. it and allow them to step out, yes. you will find yes. that. They'll, they'll want to be, you know, much more a part of it. Absolutely. And, you know, sometimes we, we touched on the commerciality of Christmas earlier on. Sometimes teenagers will be really aware and perhaps quite cynical about the sort of whole charade that they, they might perceive Christmas to be and the, the attempts to get on with each other. And, you know, they might might well have a point and, mm. and they might want somewhere where they can also go off, as, as Susie said, and meet their own friends and have a bit of a moan about us. And, you know, that's fair enough because they're making meaning in the world and, you know, they're coming up with some fair points in the process. They often are. They often are. You need to listen to teenagers sometimes. Yeah. I mean, this is it. You know, ask them what they want and why. You may find, in fact, they've got a better idea. I mean, I think <laughs> traditions are fabulous. I'm so in favor of them and passing them on. And, but you can craft them and recraft them as well. And sometimes when you have that discussion, you might come up. I mean, you just talked about, you know, the sort of tradition you may have around somebody who's no longer at the table with you. Mm -hmm. um, there are all sorts of ideas that they can bring back, um, and, and particularly if you have a blended family. I Absolutely. found personally with teenagers, my children got a bit older. In some ways, the pressures have been released. I know we were talking earlier about, a little bit about perfectionism. And, you know, when they were little, I, I, I just remember I wanted everything to be perfect and, 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 and so on. And, and teenagers kind of aren't like that. No. And shifting my own perspective around that and just thinking, well, let's just let it be, it's actually been amazingly liberating and actually yeah. really quite relaxed. And uh, so you kind of, for me, having teenagers around the Christmas table is... It, it, I've been able to let go of it myself. That's how it's felt, and 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 it's been lovely. It's been a real pleasure. Mm. It's a different experience, but it's, mm. it's lovely. Yeah, it can be fun. Thanks yeah, there's lots a lot of banter. Yeah. Absolutely. So a few more questions or, or comments, indeed, which are really welcome that have come in. Somebody referring back to the the children and tantrums. Often it's not the children who have the tantrums; it's the older ones. <laughs> for, for example, a mother-in-law showing off and complaining, yeah. and um, and also somebody saying, you know, if there are issues around a child, perhaps you know, controlling their temper, we could forewarn grandparents, we could flag it up. It comes back to the old communication, doesn't it? We don't need to just pretend that everybody is in, in some fairy tale version mm. of perfect mode, you know, and, and the children will need boundaries, but they may well not learn them on Christmas Day, and, you know, we can just get people on side with, with what's going on. I think it's a very good point. Mm. Mm. It's, it's, it's identifying the trigger points, isn't it? Like identifying yeah. what might happen. And, and sidestepping them, overcoming them, tackling them, whatever is right, um, and you know what's going to happen. The other question that came up earlier on, which I do want to make sure we, we spend a, a, a little bit of time on, is the, the question of Santa. So um, somebody specifically said, how do we address that? Do we maintain the myth, um, or you know, do we do we reveal all? So I, I think among the panel we have some different opinions. I know Susie, you're quite in favour of, of kind of uh, revealing the, the reality, aren't you? 
I, I don't mean saying to a three-year-old, there is no such thing as Santa. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm not a Scrooge and I'm not a bar humbug. But mm -hmm. I have been actually quite pained sometimes to see, you know, sort of seven or eight-year-olds running around with loads and loads and loads of presents and saying, this is from Santa. And there's poor old mum and dad in the corner having worked their fingers to the bone that year to, to, you know, to afford all these things. And there's no recognition there. I mean, we were talking earlier, I said, the, the, you know, the best gift you can give your child is the ability to manage finances. I think that sometimes we let the Santa myth um, go into a slightly dangerous situation, particularly, as I've also said, if, if you have a child who doesn't get what they want and then thinks it was because I was bad. I must have done something wrong that Santa didn't bring me what I want. So I suppose I'm saying that I think when they ask questions, the answer I have for my, what was it, almost a seven-year-old granddaughter who last year was getting very skeptical and asked me about, about Santa Claus, and I said, well, he was based on a real person who was somebody who was generous and kind and helped people. And that's what the Santa Claus idea is all about. It's about giving and, and, and sharing and loving. And isn't that a beautiful idea? Um, and I think this year she's going to be very clear about Santa doesn't exist, does he? And I will say, well, he did. And, you know, again, it, 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 it's a wonderful idea. So in other Thanks, words, I Susie. think be, be honest. Um, because if you're not, what I think is very funny is the number of families you see where you've got cynical 10, 10 or 12-year-olds who are keeping the secret because they don't want to hurt mum or dad. <laughs> they don't want to I'd, ruin it for you. I'd love to, I'd love to give another spin on that. Have we got, I don't know if we've got time. Well, this is quick, Amanda, because there's some lovely comments coming. Actually, first oh, of all, I want okay, to say no, a, great big, a great big oops, because somebody has rather wonderfully typed in, what do you mean there's no such thing as Santa? Exactly. So that's <laughs> huge apologies. And that, that, that's a man. That's lovely. one of our male participants. What a lovely comment. Um, somebody else saying that they told their child that Santa lived in Turkey and helped children, and now he's in heaven, and he can only afford to, or he can only give them one present because he's lost <laughs> children to cater for, which is great. Nice. Somebody saying they still struggle with the, the kind of northern reindeer situation. Um, and then, you know, somebody else saying that they remove the labels from presents that come in from everybody, so they're all from Santa, which is rather nice. So that's, that's a different option on that. But then you're um, not learning about, friend, you know, friends and, and, and generosity and love, are you? Yeah, absolutely. So, Amanda, what was your other <laughs> Well, only that our tradition, and again, it's a culture and a tradition, is that if everyone believes, anyone who believes in Santa in my house gets a stocking. So the 20-year-old 20, 20 and the 18-year-old, they all say, do you believe in Santa? Absolutely, Mum. And so they get a stocking. <laughs> and uh, that because it's never acknowledged that Santa doesn't exist. And the fact that Santa was, um, was uh, had too much Christmas Eve last year and had to be kicked awake to, uh, to fill the stockings mm -hmm. was, uh, was something that went a bit wrong. But uh, actually, on the, on the point of, of, of money, I, I guess the tradition has been that they're always very, very small presents and that the big presents do come from us as parents. So I think that, that, that's an interesting um, angle too. Thanks, Amanda. And moving on, beginning to wrap up now with what you'll take forward. And somebody's just emailed um, to say what a great idea about forewarning relatives about tantrums. I'm off to email presently. So that's already an actual point, which is great. Thank you for that. So one of the things we just wanted to touch on as we begin to wrap up is, you know, some of what we're looking at here is about our vision and values for ourselves as an individual, for ourselves in relation to family. And some of this carries over into the new year. You know, if I can think about who I'm being, being in front of my family, who I'm trying to be, and, and what the day-to-day -day reality is, and if I can possibly turn a little bit of that towards, you know, the, the kind of assertiveness and communication and, and respect that we've been talking about, then, you know, that can put us in, in a good position for going forward into the, the new year. So maybe it's about identifying, you know, a couple of things for ourselves that really capture how we want to be, and I'm, I'm, I'm reminded here of, you know, Gandhi's message about be the change you want to be in the world and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the way that he said his life was his message. Sometimes, you know, the way that we we talk about in-laws and their perfectionism and often they're blatantly not living it out. So, it, you know, one of the things we could perhaps take forward is, is can I live, as people were very generously um, posting, you know, the ideas of, of the kind of volunteering and giving, can I live in relation to my family the way that I want to, to capture the uh, the 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 Christmas spirit. So that's one thought to take forward. Um, some further tips and hints, many of which we've we've kind of captured already as we've gone along. So just a few captured there for you to, to take forward. A secret Santa approach can make presents easier. So there's, there's an option on that. Um, but taking it forward, what will you actually 
plan to do? You know, are there one or two practical things from here, or is it more of a, a kind of emotional shift? I wonder what you think you might take forward. You know, how do you think you'll approach Christmas from here? So we'd like to to run our final poll here, just wrapping up. What do you think you'll you'll actually do going forward? Um, and somebody's asking for a soft copy of the um, the PowerPoint, which which we can make available. But there will be the recording on your work and family space. So we definitely urge you to go into the coaching section of the work and family space, and you'll find the webinar archive there, where you can can see again which with the slides and the audio. Um, so if somebody's wishing us a, a lovely Christmas and, and um, a joy and peace and so on. So many thanks, John, and we wish the very same to you as well. So we've got a fair few people just voting on that poll. I don't know, Susie, whether you know, as poll results come in, whether you have any kind of closing tips on, on how to have Christmas be, be good rather than stressful. <laughs> I think I think the idea is to be good enough. Lovely phrase that Bruno Bettelheim invented. Not set the perfect parent, not the perfect Christmas. Something that's good enough. And the way to get good enough is to plan a bit in advance. Um, lower the bar a bit. Be kind to yourself as well as everybody else. Relax and enjoy it. And I think it, it is about, as you, you've just said, the stress comes from setting your expectations incredibly high and thinking you've got to do it all. Spread it all around a bit. Communicate a lot more. Relax. Chillax, as kids would now say. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, yeah. How infuriating is that? So a lot of people have voted here to say, you know, perhaps what I can try and do is accept myself and my relatives, have a bit of a wry mm -hmm. smile about how we are, and, you know, what a joy that would be if we could maybe stand back. There's a lot of, of talk these days about mindfulness, isn't there, about, mm -hmm. you know, having a little bit of a distance between us and the thoughts we get caught up in and, and just observing the situation a little bit. And if we can manage that, we might just see a kind of glimmer of, of, of humor in it. But um, many people now typing in to say they've really enjoyed the webinar and, and Merry Christmas and so on. So much appreciation for that. Many thanks. Just a reminder of the work and family space, which I did touch on, but as well as, as the um, archive of webinars, you can, there's a help center there. Speak to an expert. Um, if there are certain points that you want to pick up, insider guides and so on on the Help Center. And as we promised, further reading and resources, including various very relevant books by Susie. And don't forget to Woman Magazine, where Susie's Agni Ant column takes place. So many thanks indeed. We'll also appreciate your feedback, um, which will go out to you, a survey, very small survey, following this immediately. And we'd really love to hear your comments. But uh, once again, Many thanks indeed for taking part today. It's been wonderful the way that you've engaged, not only taking part in the polls, but all of the, the questions and comments you've shared. So uh, thanks indeed. And um, I wish you all happiness in the weeks ahead, however you plan to spend that. Goodbye.